All right. I think we should start. And uh, thanks for joining. We have a very good crowd today, so that's great. Um, so welcome to this uh, new Munchenerm. Today, the subject is around Chapel uh, and or making parallel computing as easy as Python from laptop to supercomputer. That sounds very exciting. Uh, we have uh, together with us uh, Brad Chamberlain and uh, Michel Straub. Uh, both will be talking in just a minute before I would like to uh, say a few words about the, the program and what we do. Uh, this is uh, a new HP developer, Munch and Learn. Uh, we have uh, two pages that I'd like you to be aware of. Uh, one is the campaign Munch and Learn, and I have Denis with me from the team that will cut and paste the links. I, the only issue is, can you get to the chat, Denis? Yes. Oh, yes, you can, okay. So we will paste all the links in the, in the chat for you, so it's easy. Anyway, we have a Munch and Learn calendar page where you'll find all the registration link for the upcoming sessions. And uh, you'll find also the replay links once we've gone through the, um, uh, the, the process for releasing those videos on our YouTube channel. So expect another week for, for this one to be uh, live. And uh, you'll find the previous uh, session uh, replay links as well. We run another type of... Uh, uh, talks uh, called the meetups and and we run a few meetups uh, we started only this year for the meetups in january we had a session from red hat on quarkus and another one from stream stream streamlight on uh dreamlight uh v function and we've got two sessions coming up in april and may one on open policy uh, agent and that's a cncf project that you might be interested in because uh, one of the reason it's also used by our uh, Esmeral uh, product um, to handle um, uh, policy enforcement. And then in May, we'll have uh, the Determine AI folks doing a, a deep dive on, on Determine, which uh, you might find interesting as well. So feel free to join this, this program. Again, this is all free and uh, we'll run this uh, every month. Uh, this is the meetups page. On the meetups page, I think Denis has uh, put uh, the links in the chat. So feel free to register for that. Uh, as always, we, we have this uh, munch and learn because we don't know what time it is uh, when you're attending these and maybe your breakfast for you, like Brad and Michelle, I'm sure, uh, but maybe it's, uh, it's dinner time. Uh, so don't hesitate to share on our uh, Slack uh, workspace. The channel for this is right there. Uh, you can also use Twitter if you're a Twitter person and we have a, a hashtag called HPDev. So feel free to join the fun. And... With that, I will hand it over to, uh, to Brad. We have this QR code. If you want to get all the links at once, we uh, redirect you to a page with all the links. And uh, when Brad will be introducing himself, I will start a poll to find out about your knowledge on parallel programming. And uh, Brad and Michelle, it's all yours. Thank you very much. So thanks everyone for attending. It's great to see a great crowd. Um, as Didier said, it's early here and I'm not really a morning person, so it's Nice to wake up and, and see so many people at this talk. Um, I'm Brad Chamberlain. I'm a distinguished technologist at HPE. Um, also uh, with me this morning is Michelle Strout, who's a good colleague of mine and the leader of the Chapel Project, which I'll be talking about a bit today. Um, as Didier said, we just launched a poll. Um, in a setting like this, it's hard for me to know who I'm talking to. So if you could take a few minutes, um, it's just a couple quick questions about whether you're interested in parallel computing, whether you're a programmer or not, and if you are a programmer or if you represent programmers, what programming models you, uh, you use or your site uses. So be really curious uh, for your answers to those questions. Um, while I'm waiting for those to come in, the title of my talk today is Making Parallel Computing as Easy as Python from Laptops to Supercomputers. Um, this may seem like a slightly audacious title. Um, I think you know, most people probably have this sense that Python is one of the easier languages to use. Uh, it's certainly very popular, um, being used in all sorts of disciplines and with a growing community all the time. And uh, programming supercomputers is something that probably most of us think of as being quite challenging. Um, so that's the challenge before us today. And this title has kind of two aspects to it. One is that this language chapel that I'll be talking about is a language that's designed to be similarly easy to read and write as Python. And so that's part of the, the story here. But the other part is that through the use of Chapel, we have enabled 
Python programmers to basically drive supercomputers without becoming experts in supercomputer technology. And so that's a specific application of Chapel that I'll be talking about a bit later in my talk. All right, so with that, I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to look at poll results. Here we go. So uh, what I'm seeing here, um, perhaps you can see it as well, is that uh, most of you are interested in parallel computing uh, and about maybe between half and, and three quarters of you, I guess about two thirds of you are interested in programming at scale. So on supercomputers or clusters or clouds, distributed memory programming. Um, a good number of you are programmers, about 71%, another 14% represent programmers. And in terms of languages, we have uh, a bunch of people in the Fortran C, C++ camp, even more people in the Python camp, um, and then sort of about a quarter each in Java, C Sharp, CUDA, MPI, a uh, little bit fewer with MPI, OpenMP, and then a bunch of other. All right, so great. Thanks very much for um, telling me that. That's really helpful. And with that, I'm going to dive into this a bit. All right, so uh, I'm gonna start with just a very basic slide here. I didn't want to assume any foreknowledge of what we were gonna be talking about today. So I'm just gonna talk about some basics about parallel computing, at least the way I think of it. And uh, you know, if this slide strikes you as being incredibly basic, if you already know all this, um, just hang tight. We'll get to some more interesting things uh, that will hopefully be new to you very shortly. So first of all, if you're in this talk and you're wondering, well, what is parallel computing? I'll say that my definition of it is taking an application and running it not on a single processor, but on multiple processors. And the reason you might wanna do this is to run it faster. So a lot of processors running cooperatively might be able to run your application faster than you could on a single processor. And then another motivation is a lot of times when you run on uh, particularly distributed memory systems, um, each of those processors comes with a clump of memory. And so by running across a number of processors, you can use more memory than you would be able to otherwise. Um, so that allows you to run larger data sets than you might be able to on your desktop or on, a, on the largest server you have. Um, and then another question is, where can I run parallel programs? And historically, this was the sort of thing that um, certainly when I was in school, like it was, it was pretty rare to get to run in a setting where you could run a parallel program, right? You would have to have access to a supercomputer, maybe through a university or some sort of uh, center or something like that, um, but they weren't easy to come by. And of course, we're living in a very different time now where parallelism is pretty much everywhere and accessible to almost everyone. Um, so any laptop you buy nowadays is gonna have a multi-core processor that gives you the ability to do simple shared memory programming just on your, on your desk. And then building a commodity cluster is um, not that difficult. A uh, number of hobbyists do this with Raspberry Pis, for example, or building their own Linux clusters. And then the cloud has become an opportunity for anyone to do parallel programming using cloud resources rather than owning it themselves or having access through it. And um, finally, of course, uh, there's sort of the traditional model, which would be to purchase or get access to an enterprise server or supercomputer. And I've listed here some of the products in the HPE uh, space here. So HP Apollo or Superdome Flex or Crate EX are all examples of the kinds of supercomputers you might run on for a very, very large problem. All right, and then the last question here is, what are the main barriers to doing parallel computing? And I would say that historically it was about access to parallel programs, or sorry, to parallel uh, uh, systems, parallel computers. But as I just said, you know, that's not really the case any much. Some, sorry, it is early. That's not the case so much anymore. Um, so I would say that today, probably the main barrier to doing parallel computing, it, you know, if you're just getting started with it, is writing the parallel programs themselves. So parallel programming is challenging by nature. It's a bit like saying, you know, well, if I leverage 100 of my friends to help me with my homework, I might be able to get my homework done 100 times faster, but there's coordination that needs to be done to make sure we're all working cooperatively and not stepping on each other's toes and sharing results and not doing things redundantly. And the same is true when you're trying to coordinate 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 processors. And on the desktop, parallel computing is not too bad, although it's not as easy as I think it could be. Um, but I say once you get to these distributed memory systems, these clusters, the cloud, um, these supercomputers at large scales, uh, that's when things get even more challenging. And we'll see some examples of this as we go. So one other basic I wanna hit before we go on is I use this acronym a lot, HPC. If this doesn't mean anything to you or maybe means something different to you, um, to me, it means high performance computing uh, as sort of a, a subfield of computer science. And think of this as just parallel computing at the very largest scales, right? Wanting to run the biggest problems on the biggest machines or at least have the capability to do that. All right, so those are my basics. 
I'm realizing one thing I forgot to say is I would really like to encourage people to ask questions as we go. Uh, hopefully you can do this through the Q&A tool. And uh, Michelle will be helping me out. I'll be pausing every once in a while for questions and Michelle will relay them to me and, and uh, we'll kind of tag team that way. All right, so please ask questions as we go and, and I will be pausing to uh, answer those from time to time. All right, so you know, in my title, I sort of promised this vision of parallel computing that's as easy as Python. Um, and so the idea here is I want you to imagine a parallel programming language that, uh, again, is, is, is programmable as Python, as easy to write code in and read code in such that really anyone who could program Python could also program a supercomputer. And I don't mean to set up Python as like the ideal language, the perfect language in any way. I think, you know, if we're all honest, we can think about things about Python that aren't ideal. I would say for scalable parallel computing, some of the things that, um, you know, makes Python challenges that uh, it's not very fast. Like a lot of the fastest Python programs are actually calling out to C or another language to get the speed. Um, and it doesn't really have, I mean, it wasn't really designed for large scale parallel computing. So it doesn't really have features that make that easy or uh, particularly scalable. All right, so we want something that's as programmable as Python, but we wanna retain a bunch of the benefits of other languages. Um, so I've just listed some, some sort of what ifs here. Like what if we're as fast as Fortran at the same time? And again, there are other fast languages than Fortran, but you know, to many people's mind, I think Fortran still has that elusive peak scalar code kind of thing going for it. The next one's about being as scalable as MPI or Shmem. Uh, if these acronyms don't mean anything to you, these are effectively the two main technologies that people use in practice today to program these really large scale supercomputers. So um, with them, a lot of the great science being done on large HPC systems has been accomplished. And that's because they are very scalable. They're capable of scaling up to you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of processors, uh, probably even higher. And, um, and that's something we need to retain, obviously. We can't just throw that away or why bother using the parallel system. We wanna be as portable as C in the sense of you can write your code and then have, be confident you can run it anywhere. Want a language as flexible as C++ in terms of being able to define your own types and methods on those types, maybe overload operators, kind of extend the language from within the language. And then we wanna be as type safe as Fortran C or C++. Um, I'll actually come back to this in a couple of slides. And the last one here is to be as fun as your favorite parallel language, um, or sorry, favorite programming language. This sometimes gets a smirk in the HPC community because, um, you know, like our jobs aren't necessarily always supposed to be about fun, but I would say most programmers I know got into programming because they found programming really fun. And I would say within the HPC space, the thrill and the accomplishment of running on a large system is very exciting. But the actual programming part, I, there are very few people I've met who actually find that fun. Like it's sort of a challenge and something you have to grit your teeth and get through, but it's often not enjoyable. Kind of in the same way that getting a hundred of your friends to help you with your homework might not be, be enjoyable in terms of doing all the coordination necessary. All right, so this slide is essentially a motivation for the chapel language. This is what we're trying to do is kind of blend these um, features or uh, concepts, that's, neither of those are quite the right word I'm looking for, these uh, <laughs> aspects of these languages um, into a single language and bring it all together. All right, so with that, what is Chapel? Again, this is the technology that I spend most of my time working on. Um, it's basically a modern parallel programming language. And by modern here, what I mean is when you look at Chapel, it probably is more reminiscent of things like Python, um, Go, uh, maybe Rust, Swift, kind of these modern languages that have sort of taken aspects of um, productivity and things from scripting languages and kind of brought them into, uh, into tradi more traditional compiled languages. Um, and of course, it, it supports parallel programming. That's what we're all about. So Chapel is portable and scalable. By portable, what I mean is most of us do most of our Chapel development on laptops like Macintosh or something like that. And then uh, we can then recompile those and run those on clusters or supercomputers um, and scale them up to the largest scales. Uh, it's also open source and collaborative. So Chapel is developed at GitHub. It's released and developed under the Apache 2.0 license, which is quite permissive. And like any good open source project, we benefit a lot from code contributions from the community and our users uh, and, and so on. All right, the two main goals of Chapel uh, at the very highest level, the first is to support general parallel programming. And you can think of this as, if I've got some parallel algorithm or problem in mind that I wanna solve, and I've got some parallel hardware I'd like to run that on, I should be able to do that in Chapel. And if I can't, 
then uh, Chapel has failed at this goal, right? So any parallel algorithm on any parallel hardware is what we mean by general parallel programming. And the second one is to make parallel programming at scale far more productive than it is today. And this gets back to the previous slide where I was talking about trying to be you know, fast and really clean code and scalable and portable and all those kinds of things. All right, so I didn't want to get too far into this talk since many of you are programmers without giving you a sense of what Chapel programs look like. Now, hey, I'm not going to, yeah. Um, we do have a question um, okay. that's related to discussing these other languages. Um, okay. So Denny, Denny Trevin asks, um, how does Chapel compare to Julia? Both okay. languages claim to solve performance issues and being accessible as Python. Thanks. Right. Yeah, so I'm going to get to some slides that compare Chapel to other languages in a few slides. I would say that you're correct in thinking of Chapel and Julia as occupying a very similar space. I think the, the story for both is very similar, right? It, they're not literally Python, but they try to capture that same kind of programmability aspect of Python. And they're both interested in speed. Um, the approach is slightly different. Uh, Julia leans heavily on just-in-time compilation, and that gives it a lot of great flexibility and capabilities. Um, Chapel is more of a traditional compiled model, like a C or Fortran. Um, but I would say the main difference is that Chapel was designed for parallel computing and scalable parallel computing from the forefront. We sort of started with our expertise on parallel systems and sort of built up what abstractions do we need to kind of build up this Chapel language. Or I would say that Julia, I, I can't speak to exactly how it was designed, but I, I believe that scalable parallel computing has not been as prominent of a theme in terms of the language design and what can be done. So the main, uh, the main large scale Julia run that I'm aware of, uh, by large scale, I mean running on a very large system, essentially ran a Julia program on each node and then used MPI to communicate between them, which is not unlike what we do in HPC using C or C++ today. And frankly, doing that in Julia rather than C or C++ could be a big productivity boost for many people. But I would say that that model of running a Julia program per node is very different than the Chapel model, um, which will actually, I'll show you a bit about on this very slide. Um, so I, I guess I would say, they are definitely very similar, that we play in a similar space, but I would say that Chapel is very focused on the large scale parallel computing problem. And I think Julia is more sort of focused on uh, the desktop user and, uh, and as things have evolved, maybe more and more on sort of the desktop data scientist or, or uh, analyst or statistician. So that's my quick answer to that. Uh, and that's a great question, thanks very much. All right, so um, as I was saying, uh, uh, I, I didn't want you to go through this talk without sort of seeing some chapel code, and I want to put it in front of you earlier, early, just so you have kind of an idea of what it looks like. And um, this talk won't actually teach you a ton about chapel. Um, that could be a whole hour talk on itself. This is going to be um, a little bit more of a, a survey of chapel. Um, but again, I, I wanted you to at least see some chapel. So I'm going to show you a couple of programs. Each of these is a complete chapel program. So you could type this into your favorite editor, save it, and compile it. And the first one is going to be one that basically is like a parallel distributed hello world. So you've got, say, 100 nodes with 16 cores each, and you want them each to print a hello world message. And so that's this little chunk of code here. Again, this is the whole program. So you can see it's about, uh, I didn't count ahead of time, eight lines or so in order to sort of drive all the cores on my system. And uh, again, I'm not going to walk you through this line by line or anything, but you can kind of see there's some loops here. Those introduce parallelism. There's this on clause, which says where things should run on the system. And using this simple uh, nested loop with this on clause, basically we can end up driving all the cores in the system with just a few lines of code. And so here what I'm showing at the bottom is um, how you would compile that. The name of our compiler is chpl for chapel. So I would compile it. Uh, when it came back, I could run hello taskbar. And then this numlocals flag basically says, how many of these compute nodes do you want to run on? So if you're on a cluster or a supercomputer, how many different nodes do you want to run on? And here I'm saying, let's just run on four. If each of those four nodes had four processors, then I would basically get 16 messages out in a fairly arbitrary order because I haven't done anything to really synchronize between the tasks. I've just kind of spun them all up and asked them to print something out. So they're going to do that. And when they're done, the program will end. Um, this is what we call low-level chapel. I hope when you look at it, it looks pretty high level. Um, but to us, this is low level in the sense that we're talking very explicitly about creating tasks and where those tasks should run. And this is a really powerful uh, feature in the language. But let me pop up to what we call high-level chapel. Um, so this, again, is a chapel program. Essentially, what I'm doing here is declaring a distributed array. So an array whose elements will be distributed, in this case, in a cyclic manner, round robin across 
all of my compute nodes. And I'm using this for all loop to initialize all the elements of the array as a function of their row and column, i and j. So think of this as creating a you know, potentially massive array spanning all of my memories, and then using this loop to initialize all those array elements in parallel. Where because I've distributed that array across all my nodes, um, when I run that for all loop, I'm going to use all of the cores on all of the nodes in order to compute the array elements. And then I'll print out the array at the end. Um, and again, I'll just show you a small run of this. So I've dialed the problem size down to five for this run. So it fits on my slide. And I've said, you know, run this program uh, using a five by five array and use four locales. So again, this is going to deal those array elements out round robin to my compute nodes, my locales. Um, they're all going to compute their array elements in parallel. And then we'll print out the array at the end. All right. So uh, this is, again, just kind of a, a quick, let's see what some chapel looks like. And we'll see some other examples as we go. But again, I'm not really going to try to teach you how to do chapel programming today. So I'd be happy to talk to anyone else after this in a different talk about that if they'd like to. All right, so some key characteristics of chapel. Um, this is sort of if you're a programming language type and you sort of have these buckets you sort things into, this is to sort of help you sort chapel into a few buckets. So as I've mentioned, uh, chapel is a compiled language. Unlike most scripting languages that are, uh, you know, uh, either dynamically interpreted or maybe just in time compiled, and this is to generate the best performance possible, basically to leverage the compiler and the analysis it can do in order to generate the best code and get the best performance possible. Uh, it's statically typed. Um, what this means is that when I compile a program, every variable and every expression has a well-known type to the compiler, and this again helps with performance. But I would say more importantly, it helps avoid simple errors after hours of execution. So we were talking about Python earlier, and I, I sort of called out, we want to be statically typed, kind of unlike Python. Um, as you probably know, in Python, since everything's dynamically typed, you know, if there's a line in your program you haven't gotten into to until you've run for hours, that line could have an error in it. Um, and so one of the advantages of being statically typed in a compiled language is we can catch those errors at compile time, as opposed to like after you've used thousands of processors for hours, and then you hit a type error or something like that. Uh, Chapel is an interoperable programming language. So like most uh, programming languages that have gained any success since the uh, 90s, you know, it's really key for any new language to not just say you have to throw everything else away and start with us. So Chapel allows you to, for example, call from Chapel out to an existing library or call from your application into a Chapel library that you've written. And I've listed here C, Fortran, and Python as languages that we've done the most uh, with in terms of interoperability. Um, but really, anything that interoperates with C, you ought to be able to connect up to a Chapel program as well. And we've had users recently who've connected up to things as exotic as um, Haskell and Halide. Uh, it's portable, as I've mentioned. It runs on laptops, clusters, the cloud, and supercomputers. And it's open source, as I've mentioned. And that's to lower barriers to adoption and to leverage uh, contributions of code from the community. So with that, I see some more questions have come in. Why don't I pause real quick and see if I can answer any of those here before we go on. Um, yeah, so you have a couple of questions. I'm gonna ask them out of order because uh, okay. I think that'll work better with what I um, expect you'll be talking about soon. So um, Raymond Freppel asks, uh, in the very distant past, we had vector processors. Is this still relevant in one way or another? Yeah, so right when I was coming up in school, vector processors were sort of a big deal, and they still are a big deal. So we still have vector processing on most of our desktop CPUs. And of course, a lot of us have GPUs, which are not exactly vector processing, but very similar in terms of the types of uh, code that they're really good at processing. And so vector processing is still an important theme, and it's something that Chapel has uh, decent support for, um, though we're, we're always trying to make it better. So as an example, when you see this for all loop uh, that I was showing to initialize my array, um, at the core screen, what that's going to do is fire up a task for core that initializes some fraction of the array elements, where they've all sort of decided which ones they own. Um, but the innermost loop of that uh, is sort of, you know, maybe I own as one of these tasks 10 elements. And so I'm iterating over those elements and updating them. And for those innermost loops, when they are generated from a for all loop like this, we know that this is a parallel loop. So we know that it's possible to vectorize it or run it on a GPU. And so our compiler will pass that information along to the back end. Um, we use either LLVM as our back end, or we can generate C code and use a C compiler as the back end. And then depending on how clearly we've communicated that information to the back end compiler, it can do that vectorization for us. Um, and we found that to be key for some idioms, 
and not for others. It really depends a lot on uh, your code, whether or not that's going to be a big win. But yeah, so vectorization is something that if it's available to you, it's something that uh, by writing parallel loops in Trapple, you should be automatically enabling. Um, and again, uh, we're always doing more work to try to improve our support for vectorization by passing along more information to the LLVM backend in particular, and then leveraging its vectorization capabilities, which are getting better and better over time. So that's my answer to that question. Uh, Michelle, do you have another All right. one? Yeah, so Luis Rolando Gonzalez it, um, says, our team um, uses Dask today in the Python uh -huh. data science stack. Then we can leverage similar APIs of the packages we are using to code, like Pandas. Right. How does Chapel allow to create a data pipeline and take advantage of diverse ecosystems like Python? Okay. And it goes on a little bit more. Is it okay. is it possible to wrap Chapel code to take advantage just where Chapel could shine similarly as RPY2 package, allowing okay. us to do a call to R, for example? Okay. Um, I'm going to defer many of these questions uh, because we're going to be talking about a use case that's very similar to Dask a bit further down the road. I guess I'll say at the highest level, um, we had. We've had users who have wanted to use Dask because they're Python users. And what they found was that they were having performance or just total problem size scale issues. And they switched over to Chapel and, and got some great benefits from it. And that's one of the use cases I'll be talking about a bit later in the talk. Um, so let me, let me come back to sort of Dask and, and using Python at that point. And then for some of the more technical questions in that, um, let me defer those to the end of the talk, uh, in part because I don't have pat answers to them um, and in part because they're a little bit further afield, which is not to say I won't answer them. Uh, I just don't know how good a job I will do with them off the top of my head. All right. So thanks for the questions and keep those questions coming in. Um, let me continue now. Uh, so another thing people might be curious about is Chapel releases. So if I download Chapel, what am I actually going to get? Um, so this is sort of an inventory of what you'll get in a Chapel release. You get the Chapel compiler itself. Again, that's called CHPL. And this, of course, is the thing that translates your Chapel program into an optimized executable. You get what we call the runtime libraries. These are basically um, libraries that you're not really necessarily aware of as a user. They're how we implement Chapel. And they essentially do the mapping from a Chapel program down to a system's capabilities. So they say, say things like, how do we run multiple tasks on these processors? Or how do we communicate between nodes across the network? Or how do we allocate in free memory? Um, then we've got a number of library modules. So these are like the standard library you would get in you know, Python's libraries or C++ libraries, things like that, that provide standard algorithms, data types, and capabilities. Um, I'll say you know, completely honestly, we are not as huge of a community as either of those languages I mentioned. So our libraries are not nearly as vast, um, but they're growing all the time. And uh, we've got a number of great core libraries that people have, have made good use of. Um, you get the documentation in the release. That's also available online, which is probably how most people use it in practice. And then you get a number of sample programs. There are a number of primers, which teach you elements of the language through little examples you can compile and run. Um, we have some of our benchmarks in the language, uh, sorry, in the release and things like that. And then as far as how often Chapel's released and when the next release will be, um, we release Chapel about every three to six months. And we just did our uh, spring release just a few weeks ago on March 31st. So there's a fresh copy out right now. Um, we're, we're debating when our next one will be. Uh, we might do it in three months, which would be like June-ish, or maybe in six, which would be September. So somewhere in that June to September timeframe, most likely. All right. And um, next, I'm going to get into some of these questions about how Chapel compares to other languages. Um, but before I do there, this is a place I was going to naturally stop for questions. Michelle, you have anything else queued up that we should handle now before I go on? Yeah, we've got a couple of other questions. Okay. Um, Miguel uh, Cruz is asking, how do you handle database access in parallel processing with Chapel? That is a good question. I, I'm trying to remember whether, so Chapel doesn't have any inherent built-in capabilities um, to, like we don't have like a database library or a, or a database like type or API within the language itself. Um, I'm trying to remember whether people have used Chapel uh, through the interoperability I talked about to call out to an existing database. I sort of feel like there was a user in the past who has done that uh, with some success, but I, I don't really, I don't have any big takeaways or, or anything um, 
anything that I remember very concretely about that experience to relay to you. Um, if, if that's a use case that's interesting to you, I think that would be interesting for us to talk about as well, uh, how we could enable that or what, what value Chapel might add to uh, just whatever your database provides you already. Um, yeah, so I think that's maybe all I have to say on that one. Okay, and then uh, Christopher Boltz is asking, uh, could we get a class on programming in Chapel scheduled in the future? So I think our team would be happy to provide such a class. Um, we will talk with Didier and the HPE dev team about uh, what, the, what the best way to uh, set that up would be. Uh, we could also do classes, you know, if there's sort of a, if there's an organization or institution out there, maybe you're a university group or something like that. Um, we have also done sort of one-off tutorials and trainings for individual sites or groups. Um, and uh, if you're just an individual user, um, there are a bunch of ways to contact us. I'll get to that at the end of the talk. Uh, and we're happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one as well. All right, so let's dive into this next section. Um, how does Chapel compare to other programming languages? Um, in this section, I'm going to use a website you may or may not be familiar with called the Computer Language Benchmarks Game. And what this website does, so it has the term game in the title. So it's sort of not trying to say, like, this is the perfect way of measuring languages or anything like that. But essentially what it does is take 10 little benchmarks which exercise kind of key patterns or uh, capabilities of a programming language and asks you to submit copies of these benchmarks in various languages. I think it supports like 25 languages or something like that. And you can submit entries and then you can surf the site and sort of compare the entries to see, well, which ones are running fastest and which ones are smallest in terms of code size. And you can browse the code and sort of look at it and say, you know, is this code that I would like to write or not? And so um, we find this site very useful and we use it as a way of comparing Chapel to other languages. And so I'm gonna show you a graph that basically scrapes the site to look at um, the shortest codes and the fastest codes and sort of combines that together in a scatter plot. All right, so this is my scatter plot. Uh, it's a bit overwhelming, so let me walk you through it. Uh, on the x-axis here, we have how large is the code compared to the very smallest code. So if you had the very smallest entry for each of the benchmarks, your language would have a bullet on the, on the y-axis, basically. You'd be sort of the most compact language. And in practice, um, some languages have compact versions of some benchmarks, but not others. So it's pretty rare for a language to actually be on either one of these axes. And then on the other axis, the y-axis, we've got um, normalized execution time. So how fast are you compared to the very fastest version in any language? All right, so again, if you had all of the fastest entries, you would have a bullet down here on the, on the uh, x-axis. Um, so smaller codes are to the left, faster codes are down. And so you could kind of think of one measure of productivity as being like down and to the left, right? If you're a uh, compact code and also fast, like maybe that's an indication that you're productive. Now we've probably all seen compact or small languages that are almost unreadable. Um, and uh, so, you know, being small isn't always necessarily productive. Um, but, you know, so the other part you have to do is bring up the code and look at it and say like, do I think this is something I'd enjoy programming in? And you know, you've seen some chapel code, so you can start to answer that question for yourself, perhaps. So looking at this graph, oh, one other thing about this graph. So I mentioned there are 10 benchmarks, right? So if I plotted all the different implementations, all the different languages, it'd be overwhelming. So what I've done here is take all of the fastest uh, entries in a language and plotted that as a circle for the language, like the small talk circle uh, that's, you know, what is it? Maybe 55 times slower than the fastest programs. And then I've taken the smallest entries in a language and plotted that as a square. And so this gives you sort of a notional idea of the space that the language's entries reside in, right? The, the fast entries are clustered around that circle. The compact entries are clustered around that square. And so what you can see here is that if you think about uh, scripting languages like Python, Ruby, uh, Perl, you can see that those tend to be the most compact entries. They're kind of further over to the left here, but they're also much slower, right? And again, this isn't particularly surprising. Scripting languages are dynamically interpreted, dynamically typed, and so not really designed to give uh, super fast performance. And then down at the bottom here, we've got a sort of mess of um, faster things that are sort of all tangled together, um, but also that are they use larger code sizes, right? And then down here to the left, you can see Chapel and Julia kind of standing out a bit as being sort of you know in that down to the left sweet spot I mentioned. So in order to look at this cluster of languages here, uh, let me replot this with a different scale. So I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit on the bottom of the graph. So same data, just zoomed in. And you can see things start to distinguish themselves here. So 
we have Rust, C, Fortran, C Sharp, um, Java. Uh, so as I mentioned, like these are you know faster in some cases, but almost always larger codes as well. Uh, and so again, you can see um, Chapel and Julia sort of uniquely down into the left here. Um, our entries on average are slightly more compact than Julia's. Um, our FASPS entries are just slightly behind uh, for these applications, although we're working on some improvements to try to catch up with them there. Um, but you know, this gives you a rough sense of how Chapel compares to all these different languages. And again, really the proof would be to go look at the source code and see, well, what do you think about the Chapel implementations? What do you think about the C implementations? Is that code you're willing to write or not? Um, and, or would be excited to write? And you know, that's gonna be the ultimate uh, determination here. But the one other thing I wanna note here is that of all these languages, you know, all of these benchmarks are just kind of simple desktop benchmarks. Um, some of them have vectorization, some of them have shared memory parallelism, uh, but none of them are using large scale distributed memory. And of these languages, really the, I'm pretty sure the only ones that are kind of designed with large scale computing in mind are basically Chapel, Go, and Fortran. Um, so, so where this gets more interesting is like, okay, well, what if we get off the desktop and we wanna scale up to clusters or clouds or supercomputers? What do things look like then? And that's where we'll go next in the talk. So uh, Michelle, I think I saw another question come in during that section. Shall I pause here for one more question? It's just about where to get the slides. So we'll let people okay. know about that. Okay, thanks. All right, so let's move from comparing to all these desktop languages to how does Chapel compare to how people program HPC systems? Um, and I'll say that when you're programming an HPC system, when you're interested in scalable parallel computing, there are a couple of key concerns. You, you've got all the normal concerns in writing code about wanting the code to be clean and fast and portable and maintainable and things like that. So all of those persist, but then there are a couple of unique concerns when you're doing scalable parallel computing. And the first one of those is probably obvious. It's sort of the parallelism. So what tasks should run simultaneously? Um, and we saw this in some of the chapel codes with the for loop or the co for loops there. Those are ways of introducing parallelism into the program. Um, in my picture here, what I've sort of shown is notionally, again, this notion of locales in chapel, which you can think of as like the compute nodes on your cluster or your supercomputer. And each one has a number of processors uh, shown here in blue. I've got sort of four processor cores per locale and then a chunk of memory in orange. And so when you think about parallelism, you're thinking about like, should I be running a single task on a single core like uh, I'm doing here, in which case I'm letting a lot of machine resources go to waste, or am I talking about running multiple tasks across multiple cores and now I've got some parallelism, right? So what things in my program, what functions, what iterations, what computations should run in parallel? You need to identify that somehow. And then the second concern is locality. And you can think of this in a couple of different ways. One is where should these tasks run? And the other is where should data be allocated? So focusing on the tasks first, um, where should the tasks run? Like I said, I wanted to run four tasks. Do I wanna run them all locally on locale zero like I was showing, or do I really wanna run a task per compute node, right? Use this distributed memory, use this scalability. Or maybe I wanna do both. Maybe I wanna run four tasks on each compute node and make use of all the cores on each locale. So locality is all about, you know, you've created some tasks for me. Where should those tasks actually execute on the computer? And that's really key to get good performance and scalability and make full use of the large scale parallel system. The second one is where data should be allocated. So like if I said, allocate a four element array, well, maybe what I want is for that array to live on locale zero because it's sort of you know, the, the main locale, the one that maybe starts up the computation and kind of owns the main thread of computation. So maybe the data should be local to it there. Or maybe what I want for this four element array is to distribute it so that each of my locales owns one of the elements. Or maybe what I really want is actually a four element array per locale. And so again, this ability to say like, uh, when you're allocating data, where should that data live? Uh, whose memory should it use? Is really key again for performance and scalability on these systems. So these are things that uh, you would want from a parallel language. Uh, and, and back to sort of the Chapel versus Julia or Chapel versus other languages. Um, you know, again, these are concepts that really aren't built into hardly any languages at all. Like Fortran is kind of one of the main ones that comes to mind that has some support for these things. All right, so let's look at the use of parallelism and locality in a simple example. This is a stream triad benchmark. It's a very trivial benchmark, but it's great for sort of exhibiting these concepts. Um, the idea behind st stream triad is I'm gonna take a vector C in orange here, multiply that by a scalar alpha in yellow, uh, 
add the result to a second vector B uh, in blue and assign that to a third vector A in purple. Um, and when I say vector here, you can think of 1D array. Uh, I don't mean to imply vector operations necessarily, although you could use them for this. And if you've done any parallel computing or uh, if you're sort of you know, following along with these ideas, you, you could probably see like, oh, well, if I wanted to do this in parallel, I could basically chunk it up into four pieces and have each task work on a quarter of the, of the data, right? Um, and this is a really simple computation to do that with. Like each task can kind of focus on its data, not worry about what the other tasks are doing so much, do its kind of vector scale, add, assign. And uh, when all tasks have finished that, then we've done the whole problem. This is what we call embarrassing or pleasing uh, parallelism in the industry. Now, this is the way I've illustrated this, the way you might do it on your desktop using a shared memory multi-core system where maybe I've got four cores, so I chunk up my vectors into four chunks, and they can all share this uh, scalar alpha because um, they can all sort of see the same memory. Now, if you're running on a large scale system, we have a very similar but slightly different picture. I'm going to replace those blue lines with red lines here to kind of show distributed memory and sort of firmer barriers between the nodes. And we're still going to chunk it up, say, in this case, across four nodes, maybe. Um, but here, I'm going to give each node its own copy of alpha so it doesn't have to communicate with other nodes in order to read or write that alpha value. Um, so pretty much the same picture, but uh, just I've replicated that alpha variable. And then, of course, in practice today, just like our desktops are multi-core, our distributed memory large scale supercomputers are also built with multi core processors. So, in practice, we actually have this blend of distributed memory and shared memory parallelism within a single application. So, I'm showing both the red and blue lines here to indicate that. All right. So, again, this is a really trivial example, uh, not intended to be representative of what real scientific applications need to do, or you know, sometimes they do when they're lucky, but usually they're doing much more complicated things. But what this is nice for is showing. Uh, parallelism, right? I've shown how to divide up the work into these separate chunks. And then locality, like, you know, you two should be working on these pieces that are close to each other, and you two should be working on these pieces close to one another. And these are key things for a language to be able to impart. So if we look at how this is done in practice, this is the reference version of Stream Triad written in MPI. Again, as I mentioned before, MPI is one of the traditional ways in which people program uh, large scale supercomputers. In fact, I would guess, you know, 90. I don't know what, 95% maybe of HPC applications probably use MPI. Um, in this code, you know, there's a lot of details here. You don't need to follow it all. The green loop here at the bottom right is basically the actual stream triad computation, the loop that does the scale add assign. The red code is the MPI code. <coughs> there's not very much of it because this is such a pleasingly parallel computation. We don't have to do a lot of coordination or communication between our tasks. So there's some startup and teardown. Um, but for most of the computation, we're not really communicating, so we don't really need MPI. Um, so that gives us the distributed memory parallelism that we wanted. And then if you wanted to do this hybrid distributed and shared memory, main technology that people use nowadays or have used for, for decades now is OpenMP. This is basically a pragma-based markup you can put into like a C program, for example, here. And in this case, for example, I'm using these pragmas to say, hey, you know, if OpenMP is supported, these, are, these loops can be parallelized. So please use multiple tasks to implement them. And this gives me that hybrid distributed memory and shared memory execution that I wanted. Now, one of the things I want to point out here is that you know, this is the simplest computation I could come up with, uh, among the simplest comp computations I could come up with, and pretty easy in terms of parallelism and locality. Yet the way that I talk about parallelism and locality in MPI versus OpenMP is completely different. Different syntax, different concepts, um, different features, and um, you know. It's possible to get work done with these technologies. Again, lots of HPC applications do. But I think it's really unfortunate that we sort of use completely different uh, technology to talk about these different styles of parallelism. And so one of the goals of Chapel is to kind of do all of that within one language. Now, as I mentioned earlier, GPUs are being used more and more for computation on desktops and at large scales. And so if we wanted to run stream tried in, in a GPU, maybe we would write that in CUDA. And so showing that here, the CUDA code is in purple. And you can see that sort of yet again, as we want a slightly different flavor of parallelism, which is to say parallelism executed on a GPU, we again have to use different syntax, different concepts. And this is sort of an example of the kind of productivity that Chapel's trying to, trying to address. We, I mentioned before sort of any parallel algorithm on any parallel architecture. The idea is that whether you're targeting CPUs, GPUs, distributed memory, shared memory, you want to be able to do that all in one language with a coherent set of features rather than mixing and matching these different technologies together. All right. <clears throat>
Uh, so again, keep in mind, this is a completely trivial parallel computation. If we actually were doing something more interesting, more realistic kinds of things people use HPC systems for most of the time, then these will become more different and more complex. And so the challenge here, as I've kind of alluded to is, you know, can we do better? And by we, I both mean we, the parallel programming community, and also we, the chapel team. Uh, of course, my answer is I think we can do better. I think chapel is a better solution. Um, so what I'm showing you here is on the left, that same stream triad code in C plus MPI and OpenMP. And in the middle here is basically the chapel version of stream triad. And you can see it's uh, much shorter. And even though I haven't taught you chapel, you know, you could probably look at this and kind of figure out pretty well what's going on. And I'll say the reasons it's shorter are a couple things. One, again, we've learned from modern language design and scripting language design and incorporated a lot of ideas just to sort of make users more productive. And the second is that we've built in features that support uh, parallelism and uh, locality, these two main concerns I talked about for scalable computing. And as a result, we can sort of write scalable parallel computations much more succinctly and compactly by leveraging the language features. Over here on the right, I've got a performance graph, uh, a scalable performance graph. So on the x-axis here, we have the number of locales or again, compute nodes we're running on. So we ran this up to 256 nodes. This is of a Cray XC, uh, one of the uh, Cray supercomputers that uh, HPE now uh, uh, owns as a result of the acquisition. Um, and each of these nodes has 36 cores. So I'm basically running this on up to 9,000 processors in these graphs. And I'm plotting both the reference version in MPI and OpenMP in green, and then two uh, vari variations in Chapel in blue. And as you can see, all the lines are basically superimposed on top of one another, which basically shows that even though the chapel code is compact, we haven't lost any performance as a result of that. If we look at a slightly more interesting example, this second example is what's called the HPC Challenge Random Access Benchmark. The idea is you have a large distributed array across all of your nodes, and you're computing random numbers and updating random elements within the array dynamically as the program runs. So kind of as fast as possible, just randomly update random elements of the array. And as you can imagine, this is a much more communication intensive benchmark because um, I'm not just operating on my local chunk of the array, but I might have to update a chunk that you own on your compute node. And so if you look at the MPI code, you see a lot more red, and that means there's a lot more MPI calls to do that communication and coordination. But the chapel version of this kernel is you know, still very succinct. It says, do all of these updates in parallel using these numbers from this random number stream and update the table in thus in such a way. And this is a case where the chapel code is not only far more compact, but also gives us much better performance on the Cray XC. And the reason for that is we've basically given the compiler a lot of information to use to optimize this program. We've said, we've got a bunch of updates we want to do in parallel. They don't depend on each other at all. Do them as, as fast as possible. And the compiler will say, oh, I see you're running on a Cray. I can do this really well in the network. So I can implement this very efficiently. Whereas in the MPI code, we've said much more about how the code should be implemented, how it should be mapped down to the system. And by doing so, we've kind of bound ourselves to a specific approach, can't really leverage a compiler to sort of optimize it for us. Uh, and as a result of that, as you can see, we get much better performance for, for Chapel with this benchmark on this system. All right. With that, what I'm gonna do is get away from benchmarks, which is kind of all we've talked about so far, and talk about some of the real use cases in the field, including that one that I mentioned um, that's sort of very Dask-like. Um, so Michelle, we have any questions before I go on? Not at this point, we're good. Okay, great. Thanks very much. All right, so again, you know, benchmarks are well and good and they're sort of short, you can put them on a screen uh, and they sort of tell you something. But of course, the real question is, what are people doing with this language in practice? So I'm gonna show you a couple examples here. These are five of our flagship applications. Um, what I like about these is that we've got sort of a real rich variety of types of computation. Up at the top here, we've got what I consider sort of traditional HPC, scientific simulation of the physical universe. On the left, it's about simulating aircraft designs. On the right, it's about simulating the formation of the universe. In the middle, we've got a few more computer science-y kinds of things. On the left, we've got a, a massive implementation of NumPy, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. And on the right, basically an optimization problem, branch and, branch and bound style um, that, uh, that some users are using to run at very large scales using Chapel. And then for those of you who may be coming from an artificial intelligence or machine learning background, within Cray and HPE, we've developed this package called Cray AI, which basically makes use of Chapel. Um, most notably, we have a hyperparameter optimization package that's written in Chapel. Uh, 
And um, so again, this is sort of an example of, uh, I would say non-traditional HPC computation, but one that's becoming more and more interesting and attractive to people going forward as AI becomes more and more dominant. All right, so let me jump into this uh, NumPy example I mentioned. And this will again, come back to that question earlier about Gask and use of Python. Um, so this is um, a project called, called Arcuda, yeah. Real quick, we did get a question come in about the random access benchmarks. Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, random access, so this is from Jagadish um, Madagundi. Um, oh. RA performance comparison was only with MPI and no OpenMP, any specific reason for that? Um, so this is a benchmark that, is there OpenMP in there? I can't even see the code either. It may have OpenMP in it. I may have mislabeled my slide, but I would say that it's a benchmark that doesn't benefit massively from OpenMP because the main bottleneck in the benchmark is the network. Because most of the time, statistically speaking, you're updating an element that is remote from you that you have to communicate with another processor to do. And MPI is all about shared memory programming, uh, sort of the local parallelism within a node. Um, usually what happens with this MPI code is that it's actually run with a uh, a process per core. So even though we're not using OpenMP, we're still using all the cores by virtue of the fact that we're running an MPI, a copy of the MPI program per core. So I don't want you to think that um, we're running with a different number of cores between the two approaches. That's not the case. But again, this is a benchmark that's not particularly amenable to OpenMP. So I believe that we didn't run it with OpenMP when we did it. And I, again, I can't remember whether there actually is OpenMP in the code or not in the reference version. Uh, but yeah, that's a really good question, thanks. Uh, so yeah, the number of cores is not the, the difference here. It's really um, how well can you drive the network? And, and, and ultimately, the network ought to become the bottleneck in this benchmark because almost everything you're doing is remote. Good question. All right, so popping back, I'm gonna be talking to you about this uh, application Arcuda. And I see I'm rapidly running out of time. So I'm, I'm gonna go through the Arcuda bit. I'll probably skip something else uh, and then summarize. Um, so, you know, the title of my talk was about uh, parallel computing and making it as e easy as Python. This is a case where the users wanted something literally much more like we really want to program Python. And so the motivation here was, you know, imagine you've got some HPC scale data science problems you want to solve. And you've got a bunch of Python programmers at, uh, that you can leverage to solve them. And you've got access to HPC systems. But as I mentioned before, Python isn't really well suited for large scale, high performance parallel computing. And so you know, traditionally you're kind of stuck. Um, there are technologies that were mentioned like Dask, which can make use of distributed memory. But I would say that for those coming from an HPC perspective in my experience, uh, and I'm not a Dask user, so I, you know, this is all kind of hearsay. From what I've heard, they have not gotten the performance that they expect out of a supercomputer using Dask. And they've also had challenges scaling to the, the scales that they wanna run at, at with Dask. And I'll give some details about that on the next slide. All right, so the challenge is, I've got these problems, I've got these programmers, I've got these systems, how can I leverage my Python programmers to get the work done? And that's what Arcuda set out to try to solve. So what it specifically does is, has the user writing normal Python code in Jupyter, making what look like normal NumPy and Pandas calls, but rather than calling into NumPy or Pandas, they're calling into this Arcuda library, which is a Python library, um, but where many Python libraries for high performance are implemented with C under the covers, Arcuda is implemented with Chapel under the covers. So it uses this client server model in which when you say something like, hey, NumPy, generate a random array for me or add these arrays together or things like that, the Python client talks to the Chapel program running on your supercomputer or it could be running on your desktop as well and says, hey, do this operation for me. And then when the operation's done, you know, it's sent back like, okay, we did that. And, and so the user's sitting there interacting through Python, but driving a supercomputer without having to program Chapel themselves or know about Chapel. Um, so this is Arcuda in a nutshell. Uh, you've just heard it's a Python library supporting a key subset of NumPy and Pandas for use in data science. Um, it computes massive scale results, which you can think of as like dozens of terabyte scale arrays within the human thought loop. So seconds to minutes. And the idea here is if you're a data scientist, you can't afford to um, have something take a half an hour, you lose your train of thought, you, you know, it's hard to make conjectures and sort of uh, keep moving if, if things aren't coming back to you quickly. It's about 20,000 lines of Chapel, largely written in 2019 and continually improved since then. This was written by Mike Merrill and Bill Roos at the DoD, and it's an open source project. So if you're intrigued by this um, and you'd like to use it yourself, or this is sort of fits a model you'd like to do, uh, you can download it and, and use it uh, again on your desktop, uh, laptop, whatever. 
Uh, the reasons they use Chapel, it's high level language with performance and scalability. It's close to Pythonic, which let them write Arcuda rapidly. And it also means if the Python programmer looks under the hood at how it works, they're not repelled by what they see because Chapel is uh, you know, reasonably attractive, even though it's not literally Python. And again, they like that it ports from laptop to supercomputer. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna start uh, fast forwarding a bit. This is a performance graph that shows performance of NumPy versus Arcuda running with a single core versus running with 36 cores on local shared memory versus running on 36 cores each on 512 nodes. And you can see even on just one node, we get speed ups of you know, three to 16 by virtue of the fact that Chapel's parallel. And then once we go up to 512 nodes, you can see you know, thousands of times performance improvement. Um, we've also done some massive uh, sorting runs where we've sorted um, 72 terabytes of information in two and a half minutes using 100 lines of Chapel code. Um, so this is, you know, I think close to a world record in terms of uh, sorting performance and certainly sorting per line of code. So these are some of the benefits of Arcuda and some of the things that, um, you know, it does that maybe DAS can't do quite so well. As I understand it, I think, for example, DAS doesn't have a sorting routine. In my experience, data scientists find sorting really crucial for a lot of operations. And so that's almost a non-starter for them. And with that, I'm afraid I'm obviously running out of time. So I'm going to just tell you what I'm not going to talk to you about. Um, the next thing I was going to talk about was Champs. This is this uh, aircraft simulation. This is a, a completely different use case than Arcuda, but it's a really great example of a small university doing amazing things and creating world-class software in a small number of years that competes with um, sort of all the big players in the space. Uh, and there's some great quotes here from their PI about how effective Chapel's been for them. Uh, if you have time, look through these slides or listen to his talk uh, to hear those quotes for yourself. Um, these are some of their performance results. And let me just wrap up here. So to summarize, Chapel is unique among programming languages. It has built-in features for scalable parallel computing that make it HPC ready, something that's not really found in really hardly any other languages at all. It supports clean, concise code relative to conventional approaches for parallel computing, and it ports and scales from laptops to supercomputers. Um, I've shown you Chapel's use in Arcuda today, allowing Python programmers to drive supercomputers from Jupyter. Um, I didn't quite have time to talk to you about champs, but uh, another use where users are getting a uh, great benefit from it in a completely different application area. Um, again, if you're interested in Chapel uh, and taking a first spin, let us know. We're very happy to work closely with users and user groups to help ease the learning curve, um, even doing pair programming sometimes where you bring the domain expertise and we bring the Chapel knowledge and sort of start sketching out some code together. Um, this is our team. Uh, it's a fairly large and dedicated team. Uh, we are hiring, so if you know someone who'd be a great fit for our team, please send them our way. And this last page has some of the resources that are available to you after today, our homepage, our social media feeds, and ways of interacting with the team online. Uh, all these slides will, will make available to you, so you can follow these links as need be. And that's my talk. Sorry to run it right up to the hour. Um, if we're able to go over a few minutes, I'm happy to take questions. Um, if you need to drop, uh, thanks very much for attending.